difficult as it is, uh, oftentimes, I mean, standing in front of an audience of thousands and sometimes failing, in fact, failing in some ways probably in every performance, the rewards are well worth the price. Regardless of the, the um, uniqueness of the horns that we play together, I think, is the fact that after all these years, we have such a similar mindset about phrasing together and about music. Masters Steve Wood and Brad Felt have worked together for nearly 20 years, developing their musical skills and sharing their mutual commitment to the jazz idiom. With Steve on saxophones and flute, and Brad on the tuba, the two have been featured performers with the best Detroit big bands and small groups. Their commitment has taken them from metro area clubs to concert stages abroad. They played with the likes of Thad Jones, Freddie Hubbard, Woody Herman, Frank Foster, Roy Brooks, and Marcus Belgrave. They've also used the unlikely alliance of tuba and saxophone to head their own band and use it as a forum for original composition and special arrangements of classic material. This latter group has performed at many of the Montreux Detroit Jazz Festival. Performances broadcast across the country on national public radio. Rounding out the group here are bassist Dan Colton, drummer Tom Brown, and Gary Havercate on piano. Thank <laughs> you. 
I've really been kind of struggling with lately is that it's it's no longer possible to uh, to specialize uh, as an artist it seems or at least in this field um, you know jazz musicians can no longer uh, simply uh, compose and and play their instruments and uh, you know and go out to the gig six nights a week and uh, you know make your two or three hundred bucks and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, exist, uh, thrive, uh, you know, as a performer. Um, you've got to wear a lot of different hats, uh, it seems, uh, today. Um, uh, you've got to uh, be a grants person. Um, you've got to uh, be a uh, publicity person, be, be your own publicist. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think a, a, a lot of musicians have uh, have made that uh, transition, um, you know, and have successfully and are successfully wearing all of those hats. And I think, in large measure, those are the peer, the people that you you're hearing about um, in the media and uh, on recordings. But doesn't this cause some sort of misgivings? You, Brad, does this cause some misgivings? You know, I think that um, first of all. I agree with what my colleague Steve has just said, and I also want to take it a step further. I think that as an artist, you naturally work within the times you live in. I mean, I think that some of it comes naturally, some of it you rail against. In these times, there are some things. It does give me some misgivings that you can no longer really specialize and concentrate specifically on achieving the goals and sending the artistic message that you believe that it's sort of your, that you were put here to send, rather. Um, but I also think that it's, it's part of the times you live in as an artist to immediately adapt to what's happening in those times. And it's going to also reflect on your art that um, you are sort of forced to have more of an interest in other things outside just being focused on your artistic message alone. I think perhaps if you work it the right way, your involvement in these other areas could actually influence your artistic message in a positive way. So, all right, you're talking about making use of all the, the controversy and the change around one that one is... You have to as an artist. Okay, well, when you look, when you, because you still have to go home and pick up that ax you know, or wherever you're going to be you know, mm -hmm. shedding. So 
when you do that, um, does all that stuff go out the window? The thoughts about, um, well, I have to be versatile. I need to be able to get this. You came in here today talking about how you had 15,000 grants to, to submit. Yeah. You know? And I don't know how, how, how can one do all of that and still be mastering their instrument, which is a, you have to do that. Or does it say, at this point in time, the mastery comes second to the grants writing? It's, you know, it's really a, it, it's a catch-22 kind of situation. Um, uh, unless I spend the time that I need to spend, um, you know, in these kinds of enterprises, um, I, I won't have the income that I need to, to continue to support my musical activities. So, um, uh, you know, I, I also, I don't want to get the impression here, I, I almost sound like I'm complaining, and I, I don't want to give the impression <laughs> that I'm complaining. Honestly, I feel grateful that at this point in time, um, circumstances are such that I'm able to, to make enough money in these various activities, all of which are related to music. Um, they may not be actually playing music, but related to music, um, and uh, and able to do that to uh, support my own uh, performing ambitions and my practicing and my composing. Uh, uh, I'm grateful every day for that. Uh, you know, I've spent long periods of my life in situations where, uh, you know, I was I was doing other kinds of work during the for most of my time, and those were very difficult times. So, um, I. Uh, again, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to be doing what I'm doing, so. You know, I heard something in the very first part of that question that you asked, and I felt that Steve answered the sort of the latter part of it, but you said something about when you pick up your horn, does all this baggage sort of stick around? And, and um, to me, and I think Steve may agree with me, it, it doesn't, once I pick up my horn, you know, it is a drag to have that time, some of that time taken away that you need to spend on music, but I honestly believe that the people, even the people that lived in an era when they never had to spend any of this time on business and on promoting themselves and promoting their musical message, I think that as an artist a lot of times you have the same problems. If, if we were tremendously successful and had everything material that we wanted, we'd still sometimes wake up in the middle of the night thinking about music we'd still be carrying around this, we'd hear every sound as we walk through the world we'd, um, and experience it at that level. I don't think there's any way of, you know, dismissing that factor as well, that if, if, if we had everything we wanted and were people of means and were comfortable, there would still be the thing you carry with you of, of having that creative bent that uh, makes you ex hear and experience and see and taste and smell things at a, another level and that will never go away.
activities that men and women can be engaged in, right? And some of those activities are very, they're all, I guess, personal, but they're very individual. I mean, you can be at work in an office and you're working together in a certain kind of way. You have a certain camaraderie that you develop. You can be on the uh, basketball court and you have to develop a certain kind of instinct for the people that you're playing with, which is similar to me. Um, playing music, jazz in particular, in a, a small ensemble setting. Because it seems to me this is one of the places where men, I'm talking about men now, get a chance to um, display and interact with one another on a real intimate level that maybe it's not so easy to do in other settings in the society. Do you, do you find that happens with you, between you? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and through with, with the other members of the ensemble as well. And, uh, you know, I think there's a, um, as with many other activities, you know, there's like a uh, kind of a, a, a macho, um, uh, devil may care sort of, um, uh, you know, tough kind of front that musicians put on in their interactions with each other, I think, off the bandstand. And in fact, I think a lot of times what you find is, is is cats go their separate ways uh, on when they get off the band saying, you know, I, I don't, a lot of kid, cats really don't hang out a lot. I mean, at least on the gig, for the most part. I think cats tend to, you know, kind of go their separate ways on the breaks and after the gig, you know. Um, but uh, you're right about, you know, the intimacy of that interaction. And I mean, you depend upon each other and you're inspired by each other and, um, uh, it is, it is a very uh, intimate kind of experience that, that you don't have in other, I mean, with very few people, men or women, uh, you know, in, in other, part, other aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, I'd like to add something to that. You know, sometimes you can see musicians that, you know, maybe haven't seen each other in a while. They'd, they'd, they'd hug, hug each other and embrace in a way that might make some people look at them strangely, but as soon as they're done hugging, it's like uh, you know. So where are the uh, where are the chicks? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's that that kind of thing. So you know, yes. All right. Now with this um, intimacy, the intimacy that you're able to establish, um, is that part of what should be or can be or you think you can identify as the qualities or, or circumstances which emerge out of playing jazz, which might do well to carry into the 21st century proper as jazz artists? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, I was listening to a broadcast. In fact, you were the, you were the interviewer um, at the uh, Montreux Festival. And um, uh, uh, but you were interviewing Charles McPherson, and, and Charles was uh, uh, talking about some some of the aspects that, uh, um, or, or some of the personal qualities that he feels are necessary for uh, development in jazz music, and it it, uh, it it just really it really rang a bell with me. Um, uh, in order to uh, you know, in order to develop a as a player. Uh, uh, you, you have to develop as a man or as a human being. Um, uh, developing uh, as a jazz musician or really as an artist in any field, I think, uh, is a matter of rigorous honesty, is a matter of um, identifying um, faults in your personality and uh, areas in which you're deficient and being honest with yourself about them and then working to develop them. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, laziness, for example, I mean, laziness is something that I deal with every day. Uh, you know, it's a man, I mean, just, just uh, doing any, all. Any fault in your personality. Excuse sure. me for jumping Absolutely. in, but yeah. I really, I, I agree with what he's saying so much because <laughs> I think that, you know, even if we didn't have these, these sort of extracurricular economic situations that we had to deal with in this particular point in time, you still wake up in the morning mm -hmm. having to deal with whatever your deficiencies as a human being are, in order to be the best artist you can be, you have to identify them and weed them out, and you have to, you have to f go face to face with them. And then they Which can, is per perhaps yeah. one of the most difficult things about being a musician or any kind of artist, is because it's like you're looking in not just a mirror, but some kind of a, 
a bizarre mirror that shows you these deficiencies in your personality and they come right back up in your face and you have to well, and, you, and what's what's the trip is you can hear it in the music you know i mean i listen to tapes of myself and uh, you know if you're selfish then you're not listening to the rest of the cats mm -hmm. you know you're and you're not responding to cues that the piano player or the drummer is giving you and um uh, or if you are then you or you can be too dependent you know, uh, I mean, when a when a when you're taking a solo, when a horn you know steps in front of a rhythm section to take a solo, you have to lead. That is your job. Is to I mean, you you can't expect them to lead you. So you have to be sensitive to what they're doing, but at the same time, I mean, you have to take the initiative. What kinds of transformations do you think the music and uh, the industry and the artists are making to give um, some some cue for those people coming up, say, 10, 20, 30 years from now, who will come into jazz at a very different stage. What cues are you giving that are going to shape that? Well, personally, I'm hoping that, to my ears, there's been a trend for the past 10 years especially for a lot of the new stars, quote, unquote, not all of them by any means, but some of them, I feel, are, are somewhat short-sighted in terms of their view backwards. In other words, what I'm saying is what the, they're the product of their development, the people that they chose of influ as influences in the way they developed is too short-sighted in hindsight backwards. And I'm hoping that, you know, I think that since this art, especially in all art forms, are, in my eyes, a connection of all the people that came before. I think to be, I think the thing that made a Coltrane what he was, was looking back. I think the more Coltrane, and he said, he said as much in many interviews. The, you know, he said when he really got into soprano, he was started listening to Sidney Bechet, you know, who was an artist that came some 50 or so years before he did. And I think that, you know, I, I see expanding on into the 21st century as a good deal expanding in the other direction at the same time. Because I think the next great strides are going to come from people really taking stock of the entire history of this music, which as you said earlier isn't that long of a history. But if you really choose to deal with it seriously, even 125, 130 years of a history of a music can be an incredibly long time since, of course, it's also evolved so quickly. I think it's, it frightens a lot of actually great musicians to, to really take hold of the entire history of the music and try to deal with it in their own artistic expression, and try to find a way to funnel that into their own message. And this is what I hope will happen going into the next century. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you. 